Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a very special video for you guys because this is going to be part two, our second installment of what I've dubbed Fragrance Connections. I just came up, you know, with an idea that I thought was kind of something I've never seen people really do on YouTube, and that's just talk about fragrances in groups. Fragrances that kind of remind me of each other. And, um, you know, even if they're not in the same category, even if they're different brands, different perfumers, different years, different territories, you know, I just wanted something that I could say, hey, this is an idea of this reminds me of this. These fragrances play in the same sandbox. Um, you know, they walk the same line, if you will. And I, I really got a lot of good feedback on it. And then I just didn't do another video. It's been months and months. I did the first one. You can actually go check that out. I'll put this video in the Fragrance Connection playlist so you can go watch the first one if you did not watch that. In that first one, um, I put some vintage masculines together, uh, like Polo Green with a couple other fragrances. I put uh, some of the old school Citrus Sheepras together, like Chanel's Pour Monsieur, Capucci Pour Homme, Balenciaga Ho Hang, you know, YSL Pour Homme, stuff like that. And I put um, some vintage Boss fragrances in a, in, to, in, a, in a grouping together. And some, um, I put some uh, oriental fragrances, if you will, Shalimar and a couple others that fall in that category. And finally, Amber Fougeres all kind of fell into a certain category like Escada Pour Homme and uh, Heritage and Ungaro Pour Lhomme number one, stuff like that. So that was the first video. Uh, the second video today is going to be even more comprehensive. This is going to be a long video. And um, there's only one fragrance that I've put into a list today that was in uh, last video from the Fragrance Connections. These are all basically new to this, to this uh, series, if you will. And that's the way most of these are going to go. These are going to be new. These are going to be new fragrances that probably once they make an appearance, they may not make another appearance on this fragrance uh, idea, chant, video idea, if you will. But first, before we get into this, we're not going to do Scent of the Day because Scent of the Day is actually going to be part of one of the groupings. But we are going to do a couple unboxings. So before we get started, real quick, we're going to knock out a few unboxings. So first of all, a special shout out to my good friend Daver, uh, who you will see under Daver Counting Cigars, I believe is his username. Uh, he very kindly sent me these. And I have to give him a special shout out because... Anybody that, you know, really special shout out to anybody that sends me stuff. Um, it's, it's, you guys are really the reason why I'm able to do so many early impression videos and, and not break the bank. Even buying samples are expensive. You know, you talk about seven, eight, nine, ten dollars a sample. Um, so yes. So thank you very much, Daver. Uh, I don't know what, I don't know what is in this. So let's find out together. <laughs> oh, I love it. P.S. These better not effing leak. The last one leaked a little bit. Um, so yes, he uh, he has improved his packing methods. Cheers to you, Daver. Cheers to you, my brother. Uh, ah, yes, beautiful. Okay, so we have um, Vertus Van Oud. Are you guys familiar with this brand? This Vertus Van Oud. Ah, it did leak a little bit. Sorry, Daver. It did. It's all over my fingers. Hold on. Let me uh, let me wipe this. Let me wipe this a little bit. I'm not sure which one leaked, but one of them did leak. Um, I was gonna say it smells like Nishane Sultan Vetiver, and sure enough, there's a Sultan Vetiver thing in here. I have a bottle of Sultan Vetiver, my friend, but I will talk about it. I promise I will talk about. I love Sultan Vetiver. I think it's one of the it's one of my favorite vetivers. Um Santal Royale by Guerlain Daver. Uh I think I have a bottle of Santal Royale as well. Uh maybe this is the older version. Uh I know there were a couple of different versions of Santal Royale from what I remember. Um and Vertis Van Oud. This one I do not know anything about. I got to look this one up. Vertis Van Oud. Very interesting. Um, this Vertis brand, uh, Daver sent me a couple samples as well. 
Uh, I haven't got to talk about them on the channel yet. Do you guys know anything about this Virtus brand? So, ah, it must be Vanilla Oud. Virtus Vanilla Oud. Let's see. Yeah, it must be Vanilla Oud. 2015 release. Uh, apple, rhubarb, saffron, bergamot, amber, jasmine, rose, cyclamen, oud, violet, cashmere, woods, vanilla, caramel, gaiac wood, oud, patchouli, vetiver, cedar, musk, sandalwood, and tonka bean. Interesting. Uh, okay, good stuff. That'll be a that'll be a fun one to talk about. And the other one he sent me that I don't have in my collection is this little bad boy, Meizen Sir Perfect Oud. Meizen Sir is the brand run by Alberto Morias, and I have never smelled one of their fragrances before, so this ought to be interesting. I've heard some people say they're good, and I've heard other people say that they are flat out boring, bland, and they're not even worth your time, so this will be a good dip my toe into the Meisenser waters and see what it's like. Okay, let me, um, let me... By the way, since I'm mentioning this, uh, if you guys want to know the trick to uh, sending decants in the mail and not having them leak, what you do is, I'm just going to cut this real quick. So what you do is you get some, um, you get some plumber's tape. And what you do is, is you take the plumber's tape and you basically wrap it around the, you know, part where the atomizer um, meets the glass and you just wrap it, wrap it. And this keeps it, this will basically keep it from, from leaking. And if it does leak a little bit, it'll just soak it up. It'll just kind of keep it, it'll keep it there so it doesn't, um, so, so you won't lose any of the liquid basically. So, uh, so yes, that is the, so that's the trick for sending decants in the mail. I always basically try to wrap, try to wrap mine if I'm going to, if I am going to send them in the mail. But thank you very much, David. This is awesome. I love, you know, getting new stuff like this to, uh, to talk about on the channel. And so that leaves one other package, one other package to discuss. And this is actually a full bottle. I know who this is from. So the other one, uh, and let me just put these right here so I don't lose them because I will lose them otherwise. Okay, so the other package is from uh, a chap that you may know in the chat as A2. He goes by A2. And, um, you know, he reached out and said, hey man, I've got this bottle. You don't have it in your collection. I would love to send it to you as a gift, basically, for everything that you've done for FragCom. And I said, absolutely, bring it on. I've been hunting this for a long, long time. So I know I say there's some downfalls of having a channel. Sometimes you got to wear stuff that you don't really want to wear uh, to test things. Or, you know, when you're testing a lot of new things, you don't get to wear your favorite fragrances as much, that kind of thing. This is one of the advantages. Um, is you get stuff like this sent to you from, from friends, from friends from the channel. Um, and so this is a Serge Luton. And it's a Serge Luton that I have been hunting unsuccessfully for years. And this is called Miel de Bois. And actually Miel de Bois uh, could be, yeah, it easily could be on this, on this list, um, on, on one of our fragrance groupings, if you will. So Miel de Bois, is, it smells amazing from the atomizer, is a honey fragrance. Um, and I know A2 was telling me that it's a little bit of a, sometimes it can be a little bit of a challenging honey fragrance, but I am over the moon, absolutely over the moon to have this. So, um, Miao de Bois, that's awesome, man. Thanks a lot, A2. Seriously, this is this has been one that has eluded me. My Serge Luton collection has been Steadily growing, um, steadily growing indeed. So you can go, you can go right here. All right, beautiful. That'll be a, that'll be a good one to talk about. Um, 
that'll be a good one to get to know and talk about on the channel. Thank you again to everyone who's ever sent me anything. But today, a special thank you to Daver and A2. Appreciate it, guys. Okay, so let's get into this video. So this is going to be a real fun video um, because I think it's a great way to just talk about fragrances that, you know, over the years, my, you know, my brain has just kind of lumped them together for whatever reason. They feel like they have some commonality amongst them, even though they're probably years and years apart on the cre creation. So that's where this video idea came from. And I've set up... Um, 10 different groups we're going to talk about today. It sounds like a lot now that we're just starting and it is a lot. But so let's get into this. So we're going to begin with my scent of the day, uh, which is absolutely amazing. And you know what? Uh, whenever I wear stuff like this as my scent of the day, and I'm just absolutely head over heels in love with it, it, it reminds me why sometimes I feel like it's such a sacrifice to test some of those new things, even if I don't hate it. It takes away days wearing stuff like this, and oh, it, this is perfect spring. I wear this in spring and summer. I know most people say it's beautiful in the cooler weather, but I like to wear these kind of fougere fragrances in spring and summer. It's the middle of March. It's perfect for this weather. It's like 60s, 70s here in Texas, a little bit rainy, uh, and this is Azaro Porol. Uh, the vintage bottles with the sticker on is the one you want. There's a lot of different versions. Uh, there's a deeper vintage version with like a proof down here. And you know, all I can tell you, if you want to keep it simple, go for the one with the sticker on the front. And this is a barbershop fougere. Uh, and it's a barbershop fougere that has a twist. And that twist is this anise note. And the anise note is out of this world, spot on, perfect. Uh, Gerard Anthony, is who gets credit in my book. There's also Martin uh, Heidenreich and Richard Wirtz who claim credit for uh, Azara Porom. Actually, Luca Turin says there's no less than 30 perfumers who claim credit for Azara Porom. That's how popular this is and how important of a fragrance it is. Uh, and so this is lavender and anise and clary sage. And it has a little bit of this posh iris, but mostly you'll get this anise that is just the perf I mean, just this is a James Bond fragrance to me. It is the way to describe it. It's woody. It's uh, it's got this slightly, um, how would I say? It's got this slightly like very slight shaving foam vibe about it. Very slight, you know. But it also smells vintage in a way. It smells masculine, vintage masculine. You know, look at the color of the bottle. How it has that '70s brown to it. Um, there's a little bit of that going on. There's this masculine vintage tilt to Azaro Porom, and I absolutely love it. And yet, I mean, even into the dry down, you can just smell how beautiful it is. The new bottles are marketed by L'Oreal, and they're probably not as worth it. Um, but I've never done an actual comparison, but I can tell you that if you want one of the older bottles, go for the one with the sticker on the front. Now, the reason I started this fragrance connections video, if you will, because it would be very easy for me to go, well, obviously, if you want something that smells like a Zaro Porom, get a Zaro Porom Intense, but that's not what this video is about. This video is gonna be about things that kind of remind me of um, this category, this DNA, if you will, this um, uh, classical, spicy, uh, fougere, Maybe with anise, maybe without anise. Uh, I don't think all of these that I put in this category have anise, if you will. But um, so in this grouping, which I never, I don't, I didn't really give them names, but uh, in this grouping, this spicy fougere category, the next one on the list that kind of caught my attention, and I actually have a video on this. I don't own a bottle, but there is a video on my channel. You can go check it out. And I love this fragrance. It's full bottle worthy for sure. I would love a bottle one day if, if a collector ever decides to like sell a bottle or something, um, then this is one you can put right on the list for me. This is Ebonet de Balmain. So Ebonet de Balmain, uh, again, this is all I have is this little mini right here, which is in pristine condition thanks to Anuj, but um, I, I uh, have a video on it. That's what the bottle looks like. It is an absolute beauty and um, came out in 1983. So we went from 78 now to 83. And uh, so the biggest difference for me between these is that 
this has a little bit more warmth to it. It's still spicy and woody, and it still has this fougere type quality about it. When you smell it, you're gonna smell uh, the moss and kind of the green touches. They both open up with bergamot, sprightly bergamot, very green. Um, but this has a little bit um, more of a twist, if you will, because this has a note of spearmint, and you will smell that spearmint in the opening. It's there. It's not overpowering, but it's there, uh, which was kind of a 80s thing to do, to put this little bit of a spearmint touch, but it's never, don't think toothpaste or anything like that. It's nothing like that. And there's also basil, and there's artemisia in the top of Ebene de Balmain. And um, so with Azaro, you get caraway, and you get anise and clary sage, but they both share openings of bergamot, anise, and uh, lavender. And this Ebene de Balmain adds notes like cinnamon and amber and frankincense, which uh, I think you do get a little bit of amber in uh, Azaro Porum as well. Um, but they go in a little different directions, but they will remind you of each other, you know, and, and um, so that's why this is on this grouping, Ebene de Balmain. Uh, and then the very next year, came a fragrance from the house of Aramis that almost turned into a, a instant classic. It is a fragrance that uh, I've talked about a lot on the channel. I absolutely love this stuff. Again, I prefer to wear these type of fragrances in the spring and summer. Perfect timing for this. This also has anise, lavender, and uh, caraway, um, tarragon, patchouli, basil, leather, cinnamon, sandalwood, tonka bean, and oak moss. And when you look at the note listings of these first three I've mentioned, you'll notice there are similarities. So we're coming from the past and we're moving uh, closer into the future. So this is 1983 and this is Tuscany per Uomo. So Tuscany per Uomo is um, in the Aramis Gentleman collection. It was originally known as Etruscan. So it was originally called Etruscan. They then changed it to Tuscany per Uomo. I've never smelled the original Etruscan. Uh, apparently the new bottles that are in the just normal Aramis bottle, which basically looks like this without the black mark right here and with a sticker on the front and you know, with like a red and black uh, cut in half, red on the top, black on the bottom with the name in the black. Uh, and there's nothing written on the side of the new bottle and there's no star on the bottom. Uh, but the new one is still quite good, but it doesn't have as much of this um, leathery, it doesn't have as much of this harsh leathery, you know, oak mossy textured, uh, almost like, you know, putting your hand on, on a piece of tree bark, you know, on a tree bark that is uh, kind of, it's not solid, it's, you know, it's not smooth, it's got jagged edges and you put your hand along the tree bark and you can kind of feel the gro gro grooves and ridges and uh, you know the um, this this highway system of cracks running through the trunk of the tree. You can kind of feel all of that, right? And that's what the vintage bottle of Tuscany per Uomo feels like to me. It feels like it just has this depth. But the difference between this and Ebene de Balmain and then Azaro por Homme is that Tuscany per Uomo focuses much more on the uh, citruses. So you're gonna get a big dose of lime bergamot and lemon in the top and it's very bright and think about you know think about tuscany and, and it'll think about the the tuscan coast right you get this sunshine you get this um uh you know you get this warmth this bright feeling this uh you know even if it's not necessarily a very hot day you get this feeling of the sun you know warming up your skin having this radiating warmth about it and that's what the opening of this feels like to me you will get this old school basil it's a little bit bitter and sharp and uh but but it never takes away from that you know citrusy bright opening this is uh, a little bit more fresh than the first two that we mentioned uh Azaro Por Uomo is so good though, but uh, yes, Tuscany Per Uomo comes in at uh, the third spot on this little grouping. Two more. Uh, the next one on the list, we're jumping all the way to 2003. And again, this is the um, this is the definition of a barbershop fougere, if you will. It's, uh, you know, shaving foam vibe. 
It was created by Jacques Cavalier in 2003, and this is Rive Gauche Pour Homme by YSL. So in 2011, I think they tried to put this in the square bottles, and then they discontinued the whole line. But uh, this is discontinued, and now the, the one they tried to re-release, you know, 12 years ago is also discontinued. And this is um, star anise, rosemary, bergamot, lavender, clove, geranium, guyacwood, patchouli, and vetiver. And so this really feels, because of the way that uh, Jacques Cavalier used that star anise note here, and bergamot in the top, it really feels like there is a direct link. You know, there's a line straight from Azaro Porom to uh, Rive Gauche Porom. And it feels a little bit more modern. Feels like uh, they, it, they've removed some of the harsher, leathery kind of touches that you get in, in the first two we mentioned, or the first three we mentioned. Um, and it just focuses more on like the herbal, even slightly floral, the geranium does tend to come through here. And sometimes geranium can come across smelling, you know, um, like a rose. Here it doesn't smell like that at all. You know, it adds a little bit of, uh, a little bit of spiciness. There's also clove, so the spices with the spicy geranium. Uh, and, um, you know, this fragrance is very classic smelling, very clean, fresh shaved, you know. Not like me right now, but imagine like fresh shaved, straight from the barber. Imagine you're you're laying in one of those old school barber chairs and the guy has that thing over his shoulder and he's got the, you know, blade out and he's got the shaving foam and he's like giving you a shave and you're just kind of laying there and relaxing, enjoying yourself, right? That's the image. Um, you're sitting in like a vintage barbershop chair. It's so um, classically masculine. It's so uh, synonymous with father or, you know, I think of uh, the head of a household when I smell this. I think of, um, you know, I, I think of uh, children being able to associate this smell with their dad. You know what I mean? Like for me, Paco Rabanne Porom was my father's signature scent. That'll always be his scent. As long as I live, I'll associate that with him, right? Even though I love wearing it, it's his. No matter no matter how good it is, no matter how much I love Paco Rabanne for all, that's his scent. That's kind of how I feel about um, YSL's Rive Gosh Pour Homme. This could easily be somebody's signature scent for their kids to kind of remember on them. So uh, that's number four in this little grouping. And the last one, number five, is going to be, I decided to go with a uh, niche fragrance on some of these, just at the very end, kind of like a newer take, an updated take on this style. And this is one that actually Rich Mitch is testing right now. If you follow my brother, Rich Mitch, from across the pond, uh, he is going through a du Ducita sample set right now. And one of the ones he sampled just yesterday is this. This is... Ducita's Isara. Capskin box, me lord. Oh, yes, look at this. Smooth. And uh, Isara is basically an updated... It's like an updated take on a uh, traditional, you know, masculine fougere with Kumarin and... Tonka bean, uh, clary sage, musk, oak moss, some pine, some vetiver. It's not exactly a one-for-one -one comparison. There's no anise. This is the only one, I think, in the bunch that doesn't have anise. But there's something about it that feels like a modernized, like you could go straight from Mazzaro Pour Homme, straight through Ebene de Balmain, Tuscany Pour Homme, you know, into Rive Gauche, and now you land on Isara. And this is... Um, he mentioned this in his review that this really doesn't feel like it has a twist to it. And there really isn't. It's a green, spicy, herbal, fresh, um, masculine uh, take on like a traditional fougere. Very well done. Uh, very, very well done. Uh, it, um, it feels a little bit more green. There may not even be a lavender note in here. I don't know if there's a lavender note listed uh, in Isara. But either way, it feels like it's in this style, and it's very well done. So that's my niche pick for group number one. Okay, so for group number two, we're going to go on to basically what I'm calling the uh, Pissy Honey group. 
the Pissy Honey Group. And if you know my taste, you know that Pissy Honey is on the menu. I absolutely love Pissy Animalic Honey in my fragrances. It's one of the, it's one of my favorite notes. And uh, probably the fragrance that best embodies that is this. This is uh, Hugo Boss number one, the best Boss fragrance ever created. I don't want to hear anything about anything when it comes to Hugo Boss. If you don't have Hugo Boss number one on the list, I can't take you seriously. Uh, all these people that do top 10 Hugo Boss fragrance lists and they're all Boss bottled, out, you know, unsubbed. Uh, for me, this really is number one. This is the best it was their first masculine, and it's their best masculine. You can get uh, this bottle. If you get the original, which I have two of the original bottles, it doesn't say number one right here, but if you get the one that has the stripes, the pinstripes on the bottle, you'll be fine. It doesn't matter, you know, it doesn't matter if uh, it says number one or not number one right there. They're both absolutely uh, fantastic. And uh, this is spicy, woody, there's basil, there's bergamot, there's caraway, there's tarragon, there's honey, geranium, lavender, orris, rose, sage, oak moss, tobacco, the tobacco is stunning, amber, cedar, cinnamon, musk, patchouli, and sandalwood. And uh, this is, you know, one of my lifetime scents. I absolutely love Hugo Boss number one. And... However, I hear the new bottles are not worth it. That's what I've heard from a couple folks. The ones that... Uh, kind of look modernized with like this uh, silver cap on top and it and different kind of style. Uh, so go for one that looks like this if you can and you'll you'll be happy. You can see mine didn't even have a barcode. They just literally stuck a price on there. Uh, but it's it's in that men's restroom animalic honey opening is just Pierre Wagner hit this on the head. So uh, for Excuse me, animalic honey fragrances, we have six. So we have uh, Boss number one. Number two, that came out in 1985. Number two is a fragrance by the house of MCM. And this is a fragrance that uh, I've been pounding the table on for a while. This is, a, if you're a fan of Hugo Boss number one, this is almost like a must sniff. And it is called Success by MCM. And this is a house you don't hear very much about. So apparently they're still around. Um, if you take a look at the, uh, I'm sorry, it's on the box. I think the box might actually be right here. Ah, uh, it is. I know my boxes. Okay, so if you take a look at the box right here, you'll see that this is the box. And on the bottom of the box, it says, Made in West Germany. Ah, the good old days. West Germany. So you know it's an older bottle. But this is discontinued now. But this brand is not discontinued. So this brand is still humming along. Um, and apparently the uh, label is very well known for their little cosmetics bags, which are pretty expensive. Um, and suitcases, very expensive suitcases and stuff like that. And they also have like, uh, you know, shirts now and, and all this other stuff they sell. MCM stands for Modern Creation uh, München Riesk Pack GmbH is the official name. So it, MCM. So Modern Creation Munich, I think sounds better. Um, but I don't think it's associated with Munich. Modern Creation München Riesk Pack. Don't know what that means in Germany. In German, but uh, I can tell you that uh, MCM apparently launched its first women's fragrance in 84, and then in 86, they launched MCM Success, and this is full bottle worthy, 100%. For people that like this type of style of honey, animalic and pissy, and it is this is an insane fragrance, but it's so, so good. Um, the uh, smell will, sm will remind you a little bit of Boss Number 1, but... It's even more, um, it's a little bit more sweet and it's even thicker and more syrupy and resinous and a little bit leathery. So whereas you don't get much of this leathery touch in Boss Number 1, in success you will get this leather in the dry down with oak moss and honey and uh, tobacco and honey hit in the very top as well. So the tobacco is kind of a base note with Boss Number 1. With MCM success, the tobacco is in the top. It hits you right away, and you're hit with lots of spices. It's it's even more spicy. 
uh, and there's just something about it that makes it seem even thicker and richer, you know, like you're, uh, like you're literally just drizzling honey onto, onto, onto something, um, spicy resinous, but it has a very posh iris note as well and rose and oak moss. And it's just an amazing fragrance that deserves much more recognition. Many people saw this as like a cheapie. It's not. It's very... I don't know who the perfumer is, but I'm a big fan. The very next year, 1987, that was 86. 87, uh, Success actually must have done well enough to um, have a brand that sort of copies it. I mean, this it almost felt like a straight copy. I have a review of this on my channel. I don't have a full bottle. I only have this mini, but this is called Pacoma's Gatsby. And it, this is full bottle worthy. I have thought about getting a bottle now for a long time, but again, it's the same thing. I mean, if a, if a collector that's selling this or something, if I can find a partial uh, one day at a good price, I'll go for it. But I don't want to give the eBay scalpers, you know, the kind of money they're asking for. But this feels very close to this. So if you want to learn more about Pacoma's Gatsby from 1987, go check out my review. Um... You know, I noticed after my review, some of the bottles that were lying around on eBay got kind of scooped up, uh, but this is also very good. And I think this was like a drugstore brand, this Pacoma. Uh, I don't think this was an expensive brand. I think uh, Gatsby was kind of just in, a, in the drugstores. I think you could find it at your local at your local pharmacy, and it's discontinued now, of course. But it has this feel... Uh, of MCM success, but the difference is is that it feels a little bit more woody, maybe a little bit more like earthy. You know, it still has that spicy, uh, maybe a little bit sweeter too. Uh, when you smell them side by side, MCM success maybe smells just a little bit, uh, a little bit heavier on like the spices and tobacco and leather and stuff like that. Whereas Gatsby smells a little bit sweeter, but they're both full bottle worthy for sure for me for for an animalic honey lover. So. Uh, then we're going to jump to 1988, the very next year. Pierre Wargnay, who is the perfumer that made Hugo Boss Number no. 1 for men, made this for the house of uh, Paco Rabanne. I have a 200 mil backup of this under lock and key, under armed guard, 24-hour surveillance, guards constantly walking back and forth. Uh, this is uh, Paco Rabanne's Tenere. So this is my little mini bottle. This is a uh, 25 mil, but I've got a 200 mil backup. I absolutely adore Tenere. It feels like you're smelling kind of that pissy, animalic honey of Boss Number no. 1. They even added rosemary to give it kind of a throwback feel to Paco Rabanne's past. You know, I'm just reminded of like Paco Rabanne pour home with that rosemary. And there's lavender and honey and artemisia, tarragon, cinnamon, jasmine, orris root, rose, carnation. Musk, amber, leather, cedar, vetiver, and patchouli. The difference is, is that the floral heart is much more amped up. And by the late 80s, it was kind of in vogue. It was like popular to release masculine fragrances that had very feminine floral hearts. Think of something like uh, Akitos by Alain Delon, right? Almost was the fragrance for uh, Christian Dior. Almost was poison. It lost out to be poison by like one spot. Um... And so Alain Delon took it and turned it into a masculine because that was what was popular at the time. And so it was stuff like Akitos and Tenere competing with each other. And this is an unbelievable, you still get that pissy honey, but you almost get this late 80s, you know, animalic floral that comes along with it. The carnation, the orris root, the jasmine, the rose, the lily of the valley are absolutely stunning in this fragrance. And if you like Pierre Wargnay's style, if that's your thing, you know, if boss number one, if you're like me and you're like, this is one of the greatest fragrances of all time, for you, you know, you could argue that maybe this is not the greatest fragrance of all time, but if you're like me and this is in your top 10 for life, you know, fragrances of all time, you have to try Tenere. Get a sample, put it on the wish list. If you find a cheap deal, grab it. Uh, you will not be disappointed. It is uh, it is more interesting than 99.9% .9 of new fragrances that are coming out nowadays. Okay, so uh, some niche ideas. What is this animalic honey, this animalic honey, pissy floral, you know, feel. Is there a neat couple niche fragrances that remind me of this? And there is actually one's discontinued. One, I think, is in the process of being discontinued. So if you want a bottle, you should probably grab it. 
but the one that I know for sure is discontinued is this. This is MFK's Absolute Pour Le Soir. And Absolute Pour Le Soir is basically straight up a pissy animalic honey. He claims that it's uh, Bulgarian rose honey, whatever the hell that is, uh, Bulgarian rose honey. But this is, <laughs> let me tell you something about this. I wanted this bottle for years and I finally got it. And I did an early impression video on it. And the very first time I wore it, I didn't like it. I was like, oh shit, what, you know, this smells so, um, almost like he's throwing the fact that it's synthetic and plasticky in, in your face, you know, like the synthetics just attack you and they're relentless. Uh, and I was like, you know, there's just something about his style, uh, Francis Kirk John's style that I just don't get on with. And then I wore it again, and I wore it again, I wore it to bed, I forced myself to continue to spray this and get used to it. And now that I'm used to it, I love it. Uh, but the very, if you go watch my unboxing video of this, I was like so excited. I sprayed it on, I'm like, I don't know about this. You know, it's, um, it's so synthetic smelling. It's like, imagine he, his mission was to create the most synthetic smelling pissy honey fragrance you can imagine. And this is what you get. And it really does smell pissy, uh, ambery. There's uh, benzoin, siam, there's cumin in here, there's frankincense absolute, and sandalwood. And that cumin, animalic, you know, pissy honey, very resinous, um, you know, like there's lots of balsams and, um, and, uh, and, and balsams and resins. And I think this is a million times better than Grand Soir. Everyone that goes crazy over Grand Soir, uh, I think this is what they should actually go crazy for, for MFK. This and Cial de Goum are, I think, Francis Kirk John's best creations. The two that are both discontinued, of course. Um, but, uh, but, but yes, this is, and that's just because he claims that these type of fragrances don't sell. People don't buy, you know, he wasn't selling enough bottles of this to keep it in production. And that does make sense because normally... Uh, John Q. Public doesn't buy stuff like this. This is for the fragrance enthusiasts. This is for the people that want to smell something different. They want to experience different things. And, um, you know, I think it's probably one of the best things he's ever made. So, the next one that falls into this pissy honey list, animalic, you know, beeswax, honey, uh, niche fragrance, is this. This is Nathalie Lorson's Opus 9. So Opus 9, and you see this is a tester, so I don't have a real cap, but Opus 9 is <laughs> one, of, one of the most insane fragrances I've ever smelled. And I've smelled thousands of fragrances. This is one of the most insane. It's an animalic floral. She made this with Pierre Negrin, by the way. So two of my favorite perfumers worked on this. And there's jasmine, there's camellia, there's black pepper, there's beeswax, there's leather, there's gaiac wood, civet, ambergris, and vetiver. And... Um, the thing about this fragrance, well, first of all, the story is brilliant. This is a Christopher Chong. This is when Christopher Chong was at the helm. The story is absolutely brilliant. Um, they wanted to recreate what the camellia flower would smell like. And why is that strange, you say? Well, the camellia flower is a mute flower. It was uh, supposed to be, have no smell. And you saw camellia as a note in here in the top. Jasmine, camellia, and black pepper. And the floral bits of this will hit you from the get-go. Absolutely, it'll hit you dead smack from the get-go. Uh, you're gonna get a huge floral opening. Like, the likes you've never smelled before. You've never smelled anything like this, 100%. Um, huh. I don't even know how to describe it, honestly. I, I've, I've kind of um, stayed not talking about this fragrance because I have no clue how to describe it. There is something that is I don't, I don't, I don't think I can, I don't think I have the words to describe it right now, other than the fact that there's this uh, very realistic beeswax accord, dripping beeswax that kind of blends with this leathery civet, you know, animalic smell with those flowers. It's almost like they took what was popular in the late 80s with the pissy florals, right, and made it into a niche fragrance. Um, and I know this didn't do very well. This and number 10 did not do very well. Never smelled number 10, but I hear bad things about it. Although I've heard bad things about this and I absolutely love this. So I need to smell Opus 10 one day. But um, 
Yes, if you are into the type of pissy honey fragrances I've talked about, don't overlook Opus 9. It is, it's truly one of these art in a bottle fragrances, okay? All right, so those are the pissy animalic honeys. Now let's go to the fresher honeys. So let's say you're a honey lover, but you're like, Ramsey, I can't do the pissy animalic honey. I want a fresher honey. So today we're going to do five fragrances that will give you a fresher uh, actually, I'm sorry, four. We're going to do four because one's an eau de cologne and one's an eau de toilette of the same fragrance. And that fragrance actually was released in the 1970s by Raymond Shailan, who is one of the uh, all-stars. You know, he's on Mount Rushmore of great perfumers. And this is Marbert Mann. So this is the original eau de cologne bottle that... If you take a look at the back, you can see right here, it says made in West Germany. Again, so very similar to the MCM success, Marbert is a German brand. This is the original Eau de Cologne, uh, or one of the original bottles. You know, I think it originally came out in the 70s even. Uh, and this is probably an 80s bottle, but I honestly, I'm not 100% sure on the years. This one I got from Manoj, and I think this is about 20, 23, 22, 23 years old is my guess. And it's the Eau de Toilette. And I can tell you that I love them both, but I can tell you there are differences. And I will do a, you can see this one's just made in Germany. I will do a uh, comparison video one day. This will make a banger comparison video. Very few people are doing this kind of content because, quite frankly, it's hard to find this juice. You know, these don't come up for sale very often. And when they do, people want big money. I got very lucky to get this for a hundred bucks. Uh, no one bid against me, thank God. And um, so, so yes, I'll do a comparison video, but this is one of my favorite fresh honey fragrances of all time. It just takes everything I love about honey and makes it um, easy to wear. I could wear this in the summer. I'm telling you, I could wear this in the spring and summer, no problem. Even though it has this leathery, honey, ambergris, you know, woods, moss thing in the dry down. It's, it's green and spicy, but it has that freshness of like lavender and it opens up very aldehydic. And um, it reminds me of the very next fragrance. This and the very next fragrance remind me of each other, something fierce. And the, the next on the list is going to be uh, a fragrance that also gets a lot of talk on the channel. It seems like recently I've been talking a lot about it. And it's a fragrance called Alain Delon. Now, the original one was just like this. This was Alain Delon. That's it. There was no classic right here. But if you look at the newer version, it actually says classic right here. So when you look on Parfumo, it says Alain Delon classic. But uh, originally, it didn't have, just like Boss, it wasn't number one at first. It was just Boss. There was no re reason for number one because there was no other fragrances for men. Same thing with this one. There was no reason for it to call it classic because it was just Alain Delon's fragrance. That was it. It was the only one available. Um, and so this is an old tester that I was able to get from Anouj at Enchante Perfumes. Um, and quite frankly, I think I like this one even more, the classic version. Uh, it is... Oh, <laughs> it is so, so good. There's something about this uh, mixture of like geranium, uh, which can sometimes add, excuse me, this fresh soapiness about... Geranium can sometimes feel very soapy, uh, and geranium here is mixed with aldehydes, carnations, cinnamon, pine, juniper. Juniper also gives a very fresh, sprightly, you know, they use it to like uh, freshen up gin, right? There's this sprightly thing about juniper to me. Uh, bergamot, basil, lavender, mugwort, oak moss, honey, amber, benzoin, cedarwood, and tonka. Another just absolutely fantastic fragrance for the... Uh, spring and summer for like, a, you know, a fresher take on honey, an easier to wear take on honey. It's not so pissy and animalic. It still gives me my honey kick. Um, this one, though, the one that is not classic, and you can see how much darker the juice is of the original. This is much more green. I really feel like this focuses a lot on the greener notes. So the trio of green notes that the vintage focuses on more is basil, mugwort, and pine. And if you, if you go back through my channel, and I actually have a playlist that's titled um, Individual Reviews and Comparisons. And on that comparison video list is a comparison video between Alain Delon 
and a Lane DeLong Classic, so you can kind of see my thoughts in a full video. But uh, but yes, as far as being in the Fresh Honey Trio, a Lane DeLong Classic is fantastic. So let's talk about two newer fragrances. One's a designer, one's a niche. So if you kind of fast forward to the future in 2016, um, Mathilde Laurent, who's uh, Cartier's in-house perfumer, put out this, and this is called L'Envol de Cartier, and this is a old tester I was able to get, and I bought this specifically because I did not want the actual bottle, which is almost like a work of art in and of itself. It's almost like a tuning glass, thin layer of glass. The bottle actually twists out. This one doesn't. It's stuck in there because this is the tester, and... Um, you know, you unscrew this and, and the atomizer pops up. Uh, and this is a... So this is a fragrance that they list notes of uh, musk, guyac wood, honey, and honey notes. And I smell uh, a little bit of violet leaf, almost like this ozonic fresh violet leaf. So imagine you take the honey with this, um, you know, woody violet leaf type smell, which violet leaf can sometimes smell very ozonic. And that's what it smells like here. It smells very ozonic with the honey. And normally I would, I would take my honey m much more animalic, even the first two, Marbert Mann or Elaine Delon. This is probably my least favorite of the bunch. However, I have to give Mathieu Laurent and Cartier a little bit of credit for putting something like this out. Uh, at a time when, you know, um, at a time when, uh, you know, the designers were getting more and more safe, she actually took a chance doing something different with this. So special shout out to her for that. And um, this is the Eau de Parfum though. And I think she kind of released them backwards. Instead of doing the Eau de Toilette first, she actually did the Eau de Parfum first in 20. Uh, 16 and then in 2017 they did the eau de toilette which I have not smelled but this says an airy and woody nectar a life potion for men to take off okay so the niche uh, fresher take on honey if you will and this is a this should be no surprise if you kind of know uh, this this house uh, this is zoologist B okay so B is a very strange fragrance because they list notes like uh, royal jelly, which apparently is like the honey from the queen. I don't, I don't really know, but it's a special type of uh, of honey. Uh, ginger syrup, orange, orange blossom, broom, heliotrope, mimosa, benzoin, labdanum, tonka bean, musk, sandalwood, and vanilla. And even though it does have, you know, uh, heliotrope, which can make a fragrance feel you know, uh, it, it can have this texture to a fragrance, almost like Play-Doh and vanilla and labdanum, which are all heavy notes. This um, orange blossom adds kind of a freshness to it. Uh, and, and, and it gives it this easier to wear, you know, almost like the violet leaf with uh, L'Enval, the orange blossom adds this fresher take to it. When you, when you mix it with the royal jelly, you get a... Uh, yes, you could maybe call it a sweet gourmand fragrance, but I think it's a gourmand honey that could be worn in many more situations. I think it's pretty versatile. So B by Zoologist is the final one on this grouping. Okay, next grouping, we're going to go to uh, a tobacco, a list of some very interesting tobaccos. And what prompted this, what prompted this is this. Uh, this is Basala, or sorry, Basara. It it um, it ended up getting the name changed to Basala, but any version of this you can find is good. This is from the house of Shiseido, and yes, Shiseido had some banging fragrances back in the day. They had the original Feminita Dubois, uh, but this is um, uh, Basara, and this is a little bit of a... Um, this is a little bit of a unicorn. People pay big money for this. Uh, and it's a leathery, spicy tobacco is basically what it is. Oh, it's so good. Um, came out in 1993. Dominique Pre uh, Presas is the perfumer. And it opens up with lavender, citrus notes, blossoms, heart of spices, tobacco, and dry notes with a base of leather, sandalwood, and amber. And uh, the tobacco in here is just, I mean, 
this is perfection. This could easily be a signature scent for someone like me in the, uh, in the, in the, um, in the fall. This is a beautiful fall tobacco, kind of very earthy. Sometimes it feels very dry. I love dry tobacco fragrances. There's very little sweetness in this, uh, but that leatheriness and the dry down mixed with the spices, ah, oh, it's so good. So people were asking me about, um, you know, tobacco type fragrances, and this is one of the often unspoken about tobaccos. So I decided to make a list of four unspoken about tobaccos, and this is one of them. Uh, again, it's a unicorn, so if you can find this and not pay big money, go for it. It's very good. I'll do a full review one day, but uh, Basara. Oh, I wish I had. I wish I had the 100 mil instead of the 50 mil, but this is one of those that you got to take it where you can get it. So another very unspoken about tobacco is this little bad boy. And yes, this is a tobacco. Uh, this is Serge Luton's Araby. So Araby is um, often known as like a Christmas cake fragrance because it has this candied um, Christmas cake feel. You ever have got like a Christmas cake from someone with those little candies in there? Uh, like candied mandarin. It says candied mandarin peel, but I was thinking like, um, I think they do like candied, you know, nectar nectarines or apricots or figs or, you know, those kind of things. Uh, dates, dates, there's a date note in here with um, dried figs, or actually is dried figs, clove, cumin, nutmeg, resins, benzoin, cystus, cedar, labdanum, myrrh, sandalwood, tonka, and tobacco. Beautiful Christmas Day fragrance. This would be a fantastic, I think this made my Christmas Day fragrance list. Um, but this is a Christopher Sheldrake and Serge Luton. Oh, it's so good. So glad to have this because these are getting very, very hard to find. And uh, I think it's still available for purchase, but I don't know what the new bottles are like. Okay, another, um, so obviously this one's discontinued. This one and this version is discontinued. You got to get the new bottle, which I've never smelled. And this one is discontinued. But the final one's not. The final one you can still just go buy, I think, at uh, Javori. But this next one is called Michael from the house of Michael Coors. And so the original Michael just said Michael right here. Then it said Michael for men or something like that. Michael, um, it said Michael Coors after this. So the original one looks like this. Then it said Michael Coors. Then um, they discontinued this and released another one that said Michael Coors, but running up and down uh, vertical instead of horizontal. And that's a different fragrance. It's still good, but it's a different fragrance. So the one you want either says Michael or Michael Coors right here at the top running horizontal. Uh, and you can tell it's an older bottle. If you flip it over on the bottom, you'll see that it is um, Michael Coors Fragrances a division of Givenchy. Very interesting. But this fragrance is a 2001 release. This is the version of 2001. Um, and it was created by Harry Fremont of Fermanish, who I think is a very underrated perfumer. I think Harry Fremont is a fantastic perfumer. Uh, this is Elemy, Cardamom, Coriander, Star Anise, Tarragon, Thyme, Bergamot, Suede, Frankincense, Pipe Tobacco, sandalwood, dried fruits, plum, and, and patchouli. And that uh, dried fruit note with the plum and pipe tobacco and suede, beautiful suede, oh, it just makes this such a great fall winter fragrance. I mean, I could wear this anytime, but oh, it's so, I'm so glad to have this. So Anuj found me this little partial, no cap, but I'll sacrifice a cap for, for an amazing bottle. Uh, and the niche tobacco that you can buy from Javoy this is my niche pick for tobacco that no one ever talks about. Uh, this is called Les Joux Sans Fates. And I think Les Joux Sans Fates literally means games are made or something like that. Games will be played. Uh, Les Joux Sans Fates. Look at that juice. Robes 08, Mark from the Robes 08 channel once said that this is the best from the house. And I, it's a hard thing to argue with Mark. I mean, I, I usually give him the benefit of the doubt. Um... Les Joux Sans Fades came out in 2013, a decade ago, and um, this is dried fruits. Uh, so again, dried fruits. Think of uh, Etta B, Michael, all have, and Les Joux Sans Fades all have dried fruits and tobacco, but this has a twist. 
This also has angelica flowers, candied fruits, English gin, rum, labdanum, patchouli, vanilla, sandalwood, and cistus. And that English gin and rum combo mixed with tobacco and dried fruits and um, cumin almost gives it this gentleman's club vibe. You know, like you're going out. You're going out and having a party. Um, you're celebrating. It gives it a celebratory vibe. And what's interesting about this fragrance, though, is it wears very close to the skin. You know, almost like a thin sheet. There's very little... There's very little thickness, even though there's labdanum and, and cystus and vanilla. Somehow they came up with a fragrance that wears smoky. It's got the tobacco, but it has this celebratory vibe. It wears very light and airy. It's a beautiful concoction, very masculine, fantastic. It would be hard to argue with someone that said, this is the best Javoy. Uh, Javoy is a hard house for me to rank because I like all of their fragrances. Uh, but there's very few that I like really really like that I would just put like as some of the greatest fragrances of all time No, they don't have fragrances of that quality, but they're all solid. They're all very good um, And this one deserves much more love. Apparently it's still available Les Joux Sans Fates um, Fantastic love it. So glad to have a bottle So so glad to have a bottle. So all right that takes care of the uh, often not talked about tobacco and they all come in this very utilitarian box you know like you can just throw this in your bag and go um okay so next is going to be what i'm calling a golden hue kind of like uh imagine like uh october 31st the grass is all brown and dry and fall is in the air scarecrows are up you know pumpkins are out that feeling. These are the fragrances I think of. So the first one is um, Sables by the House of Anik Butal. And Sables is um, Sables is apparently uh, it's apparently a, a fragrance that was created by Anik Butal for her husband in 1985. So the year of the ram's birth, 1985. It's spicy, it's woody. Bergamot, Mandarin Orange, Jasmine, Madagascan Pepper, Moss, Immortel, Amber, and Indian Sandalwood. And um, I don't know what the new one is like. I think the original uh, bottle had a little bit more like decoration on it. I don't, I don't really know. I'm not 100% sure about their versions. All I know is that uh, this is a fantastic fragrance for someone who loves that um, you know, golden, dry, curry-like Immortel, okay? This is almost like an Immortel Solaflor. It is spicy. The, the Madagascan pepper gives it a good amount of spice. And the uh, sandalwood makes it just very classy. Um, and of course, there's the moss. Uh, I don't get very much jasmine, but it's just a beautiful golden hue. I mean, look at the color of the juice. This golden hue, Immortel. Lovely. Absolutely lovely. Uh, and then there's a fragrance that came out from the house of Histoise de Parfum. And I love these little 15 mil thingamabobs that they do. Uh, this is called 1740. 1740 is so underrated. It is. It also uses the note of Immortel, but it goes a little bit further. It. Oh God. The leather and birch in here are out of this world. Leather, birch, divana, patchouli, cardamom, coriander, uh, immortel, again, labdanum, vanilla, and elemi. And uh, I think this used to be called 1740 uh, Marquis de Sade, if I'm not mistaken, but I think they took that away and now it's just 1740. Uh, but I, I love these little 15 mil bottles. These are perfect sizes. Um, so yeah, 1740. Sylvie Jordet and Gerald Gisalain are the are the perfumer and creative director, according to Parfumo. Uh, Gerald Gisalain is the owner or creative director, you know, brand founder of 1740. Uh, but this deserves much more love. I'm shocked this doesn't get more love in the uh, fragrance community. This is like a fragrance lover's fragrance, you know. It's challenging. The leather is is. Uh, almost like you're smelling a vintage 80s fragrance. 
it's uh, it's it's big. If you like Bellamy like I do, or Antaeus like I do, or Koros like I do, I mean this this has to be on the list for uh, to sniff. Okay, next on the list we have another Immortal fragrance. And this is a Ralph Schwiega creation. And this is called The Afternoon of a Fawn, which interestingly enough, just a little interesting history note. This little bad boy from Guerlain came out in the 1920s, 1922, I believe. And it's called Bouquet de Fawn. And this is The Afternoon of a Fawn. Uh, and I think there were a couple fawn styled, I, you know, fragrances. This is, oh God. Oh, I am in love with this stuff. It is so, so good. Um, apparently it's not as animalic as the one that came in the original Lalique, almost like chalice with fawn heads, you know, poking out. It's a, it's a all time classic. One of the greatest bottles ever created. Russian Adam got to smell that, and he said it was much more animalic than this version, but I, I love that. It smells, it smells quality to me. So, uh, The Afternoon of a Fawn is a Ralph Schwieger creation, and Ralph Schwieger created one of my um, favorite recent discoveries called Lipstick Rose by Frederick Mall. In 2000, he created that fragrance, or 2002 or something like that. And um, a decade later, he created this. And interestingly enough, there's a little bit of this rose. The way that the rose is done here reminds me slightly of Lipstick Rose. Maybe it's just his style. But what he's done is he's mixed it with uh, myrrh and immortelle and moss. And you can see, again, this golden hue, but with leather. So this is a very underrated. This deserves more love. It's kind of peppery, slightly smoky. But, um, you know, imagine forest floor in the fall, leaves on the ground, the shipra, you know, oak moss. Uh, kind of uh, mysterious type fragrance. Green as well, but with resins, benzoin and myrrh and, and moss. Um, and, and of course, that immortelle, that cumin -y, um, you know, think crinkly. Imagine like you grab a leaf and like it, it's so dry that when you try to crinkle it in your hand, it just kind of just breaks all apart. That's, that's the feeling of the afternoon of a fawn. Um, again, named after the play, which... Uh, I forget its name right now, but I think it was literally called The Afternoon of a Fawn, if I'm not mistaken. I think that's where Bouquet de Fawn came, came from, from Guerlain. And finally, uh, we have one more in this category, in this grouping, and it's a Parfum d'Empire fragrance, and this is called Tabac Tabu. And this is, um, I, I really love I really love Marc Antoine Cortacciatio's work because he always finds a way to inject animalics in just the right amount. He does a fantastic job of just playing hide and seek, playing peekaboo with animalics. There's honey, there's tobacco, there's narcissus, there's immortelle, there's wild grass, and there's what he calls a sensual skin accord, which sounds insane, but I swear to God it's here. It literally smells like, uh, like, like you're smelling human skin. Like you're smelling human skin in like a bed of hay. You know, you're looking for that needle in the haystack. And, you know, maybe you're like jokingly playing with like someone that you love. And, you know, you're like right next to that person and you're both kind of digging through the haystack. And the sun is like shining through a window or something in the barn. And, and you know, you can... Um, you can smell the hay that's everywhere because you're throwing it around. You know when hay doesn't move for a long time, it kind of builds up. And whenever you move it for the first time, it gives off this rush of smell. But then you can also smell, let's say, the person that you love next to you. And you can kind of smell their skin and their warmth. And that's what Tabak Tabu is all about to me. Yes, the tobacco is there, but it almost comes across as like a hay-like smell with honey. With honey, but... Not as uh, animalic, to not not animalic enough to be in in the previous list, but uh, very over hundred percent overlooked fragrance. And the only thing that I'll say about this one is apparently this is the most expensive fragrance in the top in the Parfum d'Empire 
collection because they have to make this every single year. And every year's crop has a little bit of a different, uh, you know, group of oils. So they actually put these years. So you can see this is a 2017 bottle. So I have no clue if they've streamlined this or, you know, what was going on. But uh, this is actually an extra de parfum. Most of them are eau de parfums. So parfum d'empire, tabac tabou, the final one of this grouping. Okay. Next grouping is the Derby grouping. This is the one that everyone always asks me, Ramsey, is there a fragrance that compares to, oh no, where's Derby? Did I grab it? Uh, yes, I did. Um, everyone always asked, is there anything that compares to Derby? So these are some fragrances that I think, while they're not one for one, obviously, they're not clones of Derby or anything like that. I think they share similarities, enough for you to want to look into if you're a lover of Derby. So the first one is going to be this. And I actually don't like this fragrance, but I can't deny putting it as the very first one from 1970. It's Equipage by Hermes. This is like the very, and this is 1970 we're going back to. Um, imagine Derby without the leather. Okay, imagine Derby no leather. Um, and just imagine that you made it like a spicy, woody, aldehydic. You know how um, Guy Robert is like obsessed with aldehydic florals? That is what this smells like. It smells like a man obsessed with an aldehydic floral type fragrance that tries to make an aldehydic, spicy, woody, masculine fragrance. That's what it smells like. And it's challenging. This is very challenging for me. Um, as much as I love Derby, I struggle with equipage. But I would like to try a new bottle. I want a new bottle of this because I want to see what they did to make it easier on the nose. Because this is tough. This is very tough. But you have to give it credit. It really feels like one of the earlier versions of this DNA. So we skipped 10 years forward. That was 1970. In 1980, this came out. Patu Porom. And you guys are probably like, yeah, okay. Uh, I'm going to find a bottle of that. Just keep your eyes peeled. Look for partials. Um... You know, Patu Porom is a unicorn's unicorn now. It's um, spicy and woody is basically what it is. It's got one of the best Mysore sandalwoods you'll ever smell, ever. It's got um, Jean Carlio's masterful blending. Everything in here is just so, you just feel like a million bucks when you wear this. You know, it's got bourbon, vetiver, Virginia cedar, pimento, Malabar pepper, uh, clary sage, and, um, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's a special occasion fragrance for me at this point. This is all I have is this, this juice right here. So I, I cherish it. And one of these days I'll do a full review. I'm just petrified of getting it wrong is the thing. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to do a full review of that and not get it absolutely perfect. So this is the wild card. There's a couple of these that I think are known. That kind of smell like Derby, you get the, you get the, it reminds me of this section in uh, Parfumo or Fragrantica or something like that. This one's the wild card. This is the one that when I smelled this, I went, ah, Jean-Paul Guerlain, you've been taking notes, eh? Because this came out five years before Derby, but I think Jean-Paul Guerlain was working on it for a long time. So he very well may have been working on this for, you know, even before this fragrance came out, um, but I see some serious similarities between this and Derby. This is Wheel Porom. Wheel Porom. And what a fragrance this is, man. The best from the house of Wheel. This or Kipling. This this or Kipling uh, would, would, you know, give it a run for its money for the best from the house of Wheel. And what a beautiful bottle, by the way. Uh, it may seem simplistic, but look at how... Um, Look at how thoughtful this bottle is. So you can take the top off this way and you can just splash a little bit in your hand or something. Or you can take the top off this way and really splash it. I love that. Oh, 
Oh my God, it is um, so underrated. This is so underrated. All these people that are like just pound the table on Derby. Yes, Derby is amazing, but this is just as amazing. Like um, I, I love wearing stuff like this. And this is, uh, this deserves more love amongst the YouTube community. This is, um, al so it opens up at, with aldehydes, lavender, lime, petit gras, bergamot, lemon, rosemary. And it transitions into the heart. You get lots of green notes. You get mugwort, basil, carnation, clary sage, geranium, and jasmine. Base of leather, cedarwood, moss, tonka bean, labdanum, and vetiver. And you know what it reminds me of Derby so much is the way that spiced opening starts out. So whenever Derby starts, you're hit with these, um, excuse me, you're hit with these, a blend of spices at first. Before the leather kind of kicks in later on, the first thing you're hit with to me is spices and a little bit of mint, just a little bit of freshness, but spices, lots of spices come and hit you. And that's what you get here, but with aldehydes. So it's a little bit fresher. You get some of this animalic spiciness, 80s, you know. Um, there's some roughness to this fragrance when it starts. And as it continues to dry, it just gets more and more elegant. It brings in that leather. And that's where it really reminds me of, of Derby. All along the way, the whole journey... Uh, the whole journey, but it doesn't have that Guerlain polish. You know what I mean? Like it has the formula, but it doesn't have that Guerlain polish. A Guerlain is a Guerlain, right? And um, so yes, uh, Wheel Pour Homme. I am so happy to have this bottle. Thank you to uh, Keith from Manly Sense for parting with one of your bottles. Uh, huge love there for me. And then we go to 1981. By the way, that's 1980. So we went from Equipage 1970, Patu Pour Homme and Wheel Pour Homme 1980. Now we're going to go to 81. There's two fragrances in 81 that remind me a little bit of Derby and the way that that spiced accord, you know, um, almost like a respectful. Derby's like a respectful leather. It's not super big 80s, animalic, in your face. It's a respectful fragrance. And that's pretty much how all of these are. Wheel Pour Homme might be the most aggressive of the bunch. But this is a respectful fragrance. This is Santos de Cartier, one of my favorite fragrances, probably my favorite Cartier fragrance. Um, Santos is, oh God. I mean, what can you say about Santos? It, um, it just, it feels like you're flying. I mean, it, um, it's, it's spicy and um, there's juniper and lavender and basil in the opening. And, but that nutmeg, pepper, geranium, rosemary, vetiver, there's this combination of spices that just come into play. And then woods and patchouli, you get cedar and sandalwood, amber, vanilla, with the tiniest touch. And I mean tiniest touch of castorium. Um, very intelligently dosed. This is, you know, I think the only reason they even put it there is to compete with the... Um, Antaeuses and Koroses of the world, but this is what I assume the guys that didn't want to wear Koros or Antaeus or stuff like that wore. So Santos de Cartier, yes, uh, just a fantastic fragrance. And finally, 1981, we've got Charles Jordan Un Homme. Uh, what a fragrance this is too. I mean, Charles Jordan Un Homme that has an addition that the others don't have and that's anise. So you get anise, marjoram, tarragon in the opening with uh, bergamot, lavender, lemon, cedar, carnation, cyclamen, geranium, jasmine, patchouli, leather, oak moss, sandalwood, amber, musk, and tonka bean. So this also has the leather. Oh, it was made by Francois Caron. Oh, this is so good. I mean, if you like Derby, like if you really love Derby, you'll love this. You'll love all of these that I'm mentioning. You'll love Charles Jordan Unome. You'll love Santos de Cartier. You'll love Wheel Pour Homme. You'll love Patu Pour Homme. And you may even like Equipage. I don't like Equipage, but if you're a big Derby fan, you may like Equipage. Um, so yeah, that's my, that's my Derby list, if you will. Of course, the real Derby has bergamot, lemon, uh, mugwort, peppermint, pimento, nutmeg, pepper, rose, jasmine. You can kind of see the similar 
note breakdowns. You get the pimento and patu por uh, You get the nutmeg and pepper and santos and wheel por and stuff like that. Sandalwood, leather, moss, patchouli, and vetiver. I mean, there is something just smelling this right now. Uh, there is something that is just so posh about this. It's so elegant. This is a C-suite fragrance. I mean, this is a CEO level fragrance. If you're boss, if you're the boss, you know, not like the assistant co-CEO, not like the CIO, not like the CFO, but you're the CEO. You are the boss. That's what you wear. The boss is here. Everyone else get the fuck out of the way. You know, that's Derby. But in a respectful way, of course. Okay, so next on the list, we have this Oriental 80s, 70s, 80s style of fragrances that starts with 1978. And it starts with a masculine, then it goes to a bunch of feminines. Um, but this is Lagerfeld Cologne. So Lagerfeld Cologne is one of my favorite fragrances of all time. This is what Al Pacino wore in Scarface to get into the character. <laughs> oh, fuck, man. This is uh, so good. It's like aldehydic ambers with tobacco. And the, the one that says cologne is the one that you want. If you can find the older version that says cologne spray, um, that is... Well, you don't need it to say spray, but just... Have it say cologne and you'll be happy. Uh, the new version is still quite nice, but it doesn't feel as masculine. It feels more unisex, the newer one. They've taken out some of the tobacco and oak moss and heavier elements that make it seem more woody. Uh, the new one seems more ambery, more uh, aldehydic ambers, if you will. So there's tobacco, there's patchouli, orris. Uh, the orris is beautiful. I think that's what makes it so powdery. This is powdery, orris, amber, um, glow, tonka. You know, it's such a fantastic fragrance, and um, I'm so glad to have the bottles I have. I mean, it is, um, it's it's officially discontinued now, which is unbelievable to me that they discontinued this. I still can't believe they discontinued this. Um, I mean, it ran forever up until Lagerfeld's death, and then like a year later, they canned it, uh, but... <laughs> I mean, what a fragrance he had. And this DNA is no doubt it's his, it, it's the Lagerfeld DNA is what I'll call this. But there are some other brands on here. Um, there's some Cartier and Carizia, but this is the Lagerfeld DNA for me, mate. I mean, it just is. It is, uh, oh, <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. Uh, and of course, Lagerfeld designed this bottle on his own. The older ones were metal the new ones are plastics so you don't get that sound ah oh, i love it uh so that's 1978 1981 this little bad girl came out i was gonna say bad boy but this is a bad girl this is a feminine targeted fragrance fragrance and it's must de cartier parfum the pure parfum of must de cartier spicy oriental heaven with a twist and that twist is this the twist is and this is a refill bottle which i don't really care you know um because i'm not displaying it's not a, it's not a display piece i want to use this oh god oh it's like thick resinous green you know galbanum was like the green galbanum fragrances of the 70s were like the big hit right well this is like a blending of two decades. So imagine you take that big green galbanum, orange galbanum. Imagine you take the orange from Lagerfeld, that orangey, ambery thing I just showed you, and you mix it with the galbanum from the 70s and like the vanilla uh, oriental style of the 80s, and you get must to Cartier. What a fragrance this is. And yes, this is for women, but honestly, completely unisex. 100%. It's a beautiful, it smells beautiful when I wear this. It is a little bit powdery. The powdery bit might put some people off, but it is such a beautiful perfume. It's hard to imagine someone not liking this. Um, Must de Cartier Parfum. A beauty. 
Uh, and then, so that was 1981. 1982, Lagerfeld comes back and says, uh, I'm taking the throne back. This is my playground. And they release this, KL. KL for women. Uh, spicy Oriental with aldehydes, clove, and the clove and the aldehydes and the orchid is really what set this apart. You know, the um, spices, the orange, again, that orangey thing that Lagerfeld does so good, right? Uh, it's here with ambergris, civet, patchouli, sandalwood, frankincense, styrax, vanilla, labdanum, ylang ylang, pimento, rose, cinnamon. Pimento was just a popular note in the early 80s. Um, and this one, like, you know, bottle of the year, the, the Pure Parfum did. Pure Parfum bottle looks like a glass version of just the top. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful bottle. And then uh, they came out with a masculine version in 86 called KL Om. And the difference is that this does not have the pimento and it doesn't have the aldehydes of the women's version and it doesn't have the orchid, but it has just about everything else. It's uh, orange. Oh, they've added rosewood. They added rosewood, took out the aldehydes and they called it KL Om. It's basically the same fragrance almost. Um, maybe they amped up the musk a little bit, uh, and they may have amped up the civet just a little bit, but everything else is the same. It, these two smell very, very similar. I love them both. And there is absolutely nothing that makes this feminine. There's nothing that makes this masculine to me. It's just, just kind of marketing with these. Um, but what a fragrance, what a fragrance that Lagerfeld came out. What a, what a decade Lagerfeld basically had from Lagerfeld Classic in 78 all the way until the early 90s when they released Photo by uh, Lagerfeld. What a run that house had. I love all these. K.L. Om. Okay, and then that led to the final fragrance on this little grouping, which is a Kritzia fragrance. And I, I will tell you right now, value for money, you're not going to do much better than this. This is... Um, I think I got both of these for $70, the 100ml of the Eau de Toilette and the 100ml of the Eau de Parfum. And they're Dominique Ropions. So this is Mandarin Orange, Aldehydes, Galbanum. This came out in 91, by the way. Galbanum, Bergamot, Green Notes, Lemon, Peach, Basil, Carnation, Rose, Jasmine, Lily of the Valley, Labdanum, Sandalwood, Vanilla, Civet, Patchouli, Tonka Bean, Cedar, and Amber. So imagine you take like... Um, Obsession from Calvin Klein for women and add the huge galbanum note from Must de Cartier, kind of combine them, right? And add some of that Dominique Ropion flair, you know, a little bit of peach, a little bit of basil. It's just beautiful. It's, uh, it's unbelievable how cheap this stuff is. Value for money is through the roof, in my opinion. And look at this bottle. I don't really know what you know, crazy Kritzia, why an apple? If this is supposed to be an apple, not really sure what that has to do with crazy Kritzia. There's no apple in here, but it's, um, it's fantastic. Love it. And then, so we're going to do, we are going to do, the final one is going to be a grouping of I'm actually going to save, I'm going to save the last two because the video is getting a little bit long. So we're going to do the final grouping. I'll save it for a part three. Uh, the final grouping of this version of uh, Fragrance Connections is going to be the Tobacco Vini DNA. Everyone asked me about Tobacco Vini. And this is one I get a lot of questions about. What fragrances smell like Tobacco Vini? Uh, this is my bottle, 30 mil, that I bought pretty recently because I wanted a bottle. I have a decant. I have about eight or seven or eight mils left in that decant. And it's a, this is a fragrance that when Tom Ford came out, to be fair, they had some bangers when Oud Wood and Tobacco Vini and Plum Japonais and all that stuff came out originally. Um, I mean, they had some killer fragrances, Tuscan Leather, and uh, they've been kind of reformulated over the years. But Tobacco Vini uh, is... Vanilla and tobacco, obviously, with dried fruits, 
and cacao, ginger, resins, and tonka. So it couldn't make the different tobacco list that I did because everyone copies this DNA. And I'm going to show you three fragrances in my collection that really remind me of uh, tobacco vanille. And so one of them, I guess I should put this the right way. Uh, one of them is a Frank Bocklet fragrance from 20, let's see, 2014. Frank Bocklet came out with this little bad boy. And this is called Tobacco. Go figure, eh? And it's a Tobacco Vanille clone, basically. 2014, uh, it's not necessarily a clone. They've added some things that Tobacco Vanille doesn't have. This has plum, whereas Tobacco Vanille has dried fruits. Uh, but in a nutshell, it's pretty much Tobacco Vanille with Tonka, ginger. They did add a little bit of ginger. Uh, cedarwood, clove, vanilla, benzoin, and vetiver. It's not a bad fragrance. It's just, I prefer Tobacco Vanille, to be honest with you. Um, it's it, it just kind of is one of those things. But I'll still wear this. It's still good. It's not a bad fragrance. It's just, uh, it's not as good as some of the people that hype it make it to seem. And ditto for this one right here. If you ever thought, you know what? The one thing that Tobacco Vanille needs is some oud and frankincense. Well, here you go. This is Amar Oud's Oud Tabak. Kind of feels like a Tobacco Vanille cast-off fragrance, if you will. Like a Tom Ford that didn't uh, didn't make it the distance. So Amar Oud is uh, heliotrope, coriander, ginger, saffron, oud, amber woods, frankincense, pipe tobacco, bourbon vanilla, cistus musk, and Nootka Cypress. And I must admit, you know, if you really like tobacco vanille and you don't mind that oud accord uh, in here, it's pretty nice. I think they did a good job with this one. This is the only one that I own from the brand. Um, it's the only one that I own from the brand. And I mean, it, uh, it, it feels like a tobacco vanille type perfume. And probably the winner of the bunch though, the one that is probably full bottle worthy, is this little bad boy. This is Vanille Havan. And Vanille Havan by Listen de Modables. I have a video on Havi Vanille Havan if you wanna if you want to hear my thoughts. It's grown on me since I've done that video. Um, this is basically Colombian cacao, uh, Camorian vanilla, and Egyptian jasmine. And it's an Antoine Lee. And I just thought it was a little too sweet. That's my problem with this, is the sweetness was just a little much. I just wanted the sweetness to be toned down some, uh, because, but I think this was supposed to be like the, you know, like the, like the best seller for the masses fragrance, if you will. But I still think that it's, uh, interesting for, you know, perfume lovers to, to, to grab, even though, even though it has a tobacco vanille vibe to me, there's no tobacco note listed in Parfumo, but I definitely get a tobacco accord. Um, and so, yes, it's good. It's uh, the cacao smells very high quality from memory. Um, hell, let's do, let's do, let's just knock the rest of these out. You know, we're already here. Let's just do it. Let's knock them all out. There's only two more groupings to go. Let's do it. The video will be even longer, but we'll knock these out. That'll give us more things to do next time. Okay, so the next list, uh, the next grouping, if you will, Fragrance Connection, is going to be animalic fragrances from the uh, 80s and early 90s. And we're going to kick it off with the animalic fragrance to end all animalic fragrances. The fact this came from a designer house still blows my mind. This is Koros. YSL's Koros. This is actually the original Charles of the Ritz bottle. Um, and... The fragrance is about right there. I didn't use all this. Anuj found me a partial that I've, you know, used since then, obviously. But, uh, I mean, look at the, whatever this stuff is that's in here, look at what it's done to the bottle and to the atomizer over the years. Um, whatever's in Koros, that animalis note, wow. Um... Animalic is is the name of the game. This is like uh, you know, this is this is like contrast between contrast between the angel and the devil. It's um, aldehyde, sit, clary sage, bergamot, coriander, tarragon, carnation, geranium, jasmine, orris root, patchouli, cinnamon, vetiver, 
civet, oak moss, musk, amber, frankincense, leather, honey, tonka bean, and vanilla. And Rich Mitch says this is a story of a man taking a shower. He was originally very dirty, then he takes a shower and gets clean. I could see that. There's a little bit of that. There's a little bit of this muskiness in the base. There's honey in here, but it's that civet. It's that, it's that civet, man. The civet, people. Oh, wow. What a fragrance. What a creation. Um, and so this DNA obviously set off a firestorm in the 80s. So fragrances that will remind you a little bit of that Koros DNA. Next on the list, we're going to jump all the way to uh, 1986. And this is Marbert Gentleman. So this is the aftershave, thanks to Anuj, and this is the eau de toilette that I bought. These are actually made in West Germany. Let's see if I can show you. Yes, made in West Germany, the rascals. Beautiful thing. Um, Marbert Gentleman is, to me, um, oh... You know, uh, I wore this to work. Um, I wore this to work a couple months back, and it is an enormous fragrance. I never really felt out of place because I, I per, first of all, I really don't care. Um, I wear whatever I want, whenever I want. I don't usually even do seasons anymore. But um, Marbert Gentleman is a fragrance that smells very musky, very animalic. You definitely get the civet. You definitely get this, um, um, almost like this slight vintage musky feel to it, too. Almost like you took a little bit of something like uh, Musk Kublai Khan. Okay, imagine you took something like uh, Musk Kublai Khan and blended Musk's Kublai Khan with uh, Koros, right? And got a little bit of that civet going with the musk. Um, and I'm trying to see what is in here. I forgot. Marbert Gentleman. Um, what's in here? Uh, Galbanum, Tarragon, Artemisia, Bergamot, and Amalfi Lemon in the top. Now, this is from Fragrantica, so take that with a grain of salt. Patchouli, Rose, Jasmine, Vetiver, Geranium, Virginia, Cedar in the heart. Base of civet, French labdanum, olibanum, musk, oak moss, and leather. Okay, so I definitely get the olibanum thing, because definitely a little bit of that, you know, lemony, smoky, but almost like a fresh olibanum mix, mixed with musk and civet. Labdanum, absolutely, almost like this ambery labdanum. Um, and whatever the green bits are op coming out in the opening, that could easily be that tarragon... Uh, and Artemisia, and tarragon can sometimes give off this anise-like smell as well with that uh, resinous galbanum, and it dries down to this uh, oak mossy leather as well. Absolutely beautiful. Um, refreshing masculine fragrance, they say. Well, I don't know about refreshing, but this definitely has to be on the list if you love animalics from the 80s. And then we've got one of the greatest uh, animalic fragrances of all time. Most people compare it with Koros. It's like the competition to Koros. Which do you like more, Koros or this? And it's Ted Lapidus Porom. Sorry, take that back. Ted Lapidus Porom came out in 78. This is Lapidus Porom from 1987. And Lapidus Porom um, is an unbelievable fragrance that has everything the kitchen sink, everything, including the kitchen sink. This could have also been in the animalic honey category because it is animalic honey, but I decided to put it here because I think it deserves to go head to head with Koros. It deserves to be in the same grouping as Koros. You know, it has that, um, it has that pissy animalic honey, yes, but it also has this, uh, this civet patchouli, tobacco, dry down with this lavender, pineapple, t juniper freshness. It's a fragrance that doesn't seem like it should work to me. Martin Gras created this, and my God, man, my God. You know, whenever I smell this stuff, I'm just like, why, why do I bother? 
why do I not just wear what I love? Like, you know, with the Zorro Porom today or um, these, these kind of fragrance that are my favorites. I mean, why? Why do I even mess with testing out new things? Um, there's so many good things that I have that I absolutely love. Lapidus Porom is one of them. And then in 1988, this came out, Furyo. So I have five bottles of this stuff. I love Furyo. Spicy, animalic. It's basically Ambrette with Civet. So I think Ambrette, Civet with some lavender and, and carnation and, you know, florals, old school florals and thyme. But think Ambrette and Civet. Those are the two main ingredients to my nose. Oh, wow. And someone sent me a little bit of a vintage. So we're going to do a comparison video one day. The modern that I have versus the vintage one that said 88 proof or 85 proof down there. I cannot wait for that video. I need to do that soon. In the final one from this, um, from this little grouping, if you will, and this is from the 90s. This is a 90s fragrance that wants to be an 80s fragrance. It's discontinued. It's joint by the house of Aroco Barocco or Rocco Barocco, if you prefer. 1993. It's a little bit more green. Still has that animalic funk, if you will. Don't worry about who you're buying it from, whether it's um, Hescanas, which is the last one to own the license for Rocco Barocco, whether it's P2 or 2P Parfums, or it doesn't matter. Get anyone you can get. Anyone you can get. They are just stunning. Uh, basil, bergamot, caraway, green notes, mugwort, aldehydes, coriander, lemon, honey, orris, rose, tobacco, cardamom, carnation, geranium, jasmine. Cedar, civet, ambergris, labdanum, leather, musk, patchouli, tonka bean, and vetiver. And actually, Sebastian put this as his favorite vintage fragrance of all time. I can't blame him. I mean, it's up there with the Koroses and the Lapidus Poroms and Marbert Gentlemen's. And what a fragrance. No one talks about Hardly anyone talks about it. And finally, last grouping. Patchouli through the years. We have to have a patchouli through the years. I've, I've talked about my theory before, but it starts with Pour Monsieur by Pierre Cardin. Not Chanel, but Pierre Cardin's Pour Monsieur. This is um, lavender, bergamot, lemon, orange, basil, patchouli, and leather. And that patchouli leather combination is a killer with carnation, geranium, sandalwood, iris, Amber, leather, tonka bean, uh, vanilla, benzoin, and moss. And this is the uh, Eau de Toilette, although this is an older bottle. I think they also have some Eau de Colognes that are even older. I need to try to get maybe an Eau de Cologne set or something. But uh, Poor Monsieur, Poor Monsieur by Pierre Cardin is right up my alley. I love this juice. I love this type of juice. And the patchouli is very prominent. And I have a feeling that this is actually what influenced my favorite patchouli of all time, which is this. Givenchy Gentleman from 1974. This is the Eau de Toilette. See the short ingredient list right there. Um, Givenchy Gentleman is a Paul Leger creation. And this is, um, this is again, my. I mean, if I had to pick a signature scent, this would be in contention. No doubt about it. So be in contention. Spicy, leathery, honey, patchouli. Oh, God. Oh. Oh. Um, honey, cinnamon, bergamot, lemon, rose, patchouli, cedar, jasmine, orris, patchouli. Patchouli again. Leather, oak moss, musk, vetiver, amber, and vanilla. Uh, spicy, leathery, and I think there's castorium in this, even though it's not listed. I think they used it to build the uh, leathery base, if you will. But it's animalic. Uh, this could easily have been in the animalic honey department as well. But it went into the patchouli department because I, I literally think it's the best patchouli of all time. Um, one of my all-time favorites, indeed. And then we have an overlooked fragrance, but probably not for long. This is uh, Giorgio for Men by Giorgio Beverly Hills. And this is an older bottle, but, um, oh, God. I love this DNA, in case you can't tell. Giorgio for Men is um, spicy, woody, aldehydic. It opens up also slightly fruity with a little bit of pimento. So you'll get that pimento note was very popular in the early 80s with patchouli, carnation, orris root. The orris root makes it slightly powdery, 
uh, slightly earthy, and um, cedar, cinnamon, sandalwood, rose, with honey, oak moss, amber, benzoin, musk, tonka bean, and vanilla. And this is discontinued. I can't believe it. I can't believe it's discontinued. Um, oh, God, I love this, though. I love Giorgio for men. And finally, actually two more. Um, the best celebrity fragrance of all time, Luciano Pavarotti. Uh, Luciano Pavarotti, man. Let me tell you, I have... So I had a bottle that broke, kind of like my uh, Oscar de la Renta bottle broke, and I had to I had to decant some. So I still have probably 20 or 30 mils of decants floating around, and I have this uh, 70 mil bottle, it must be. How big are you? You are a 75 mil bottle, excuse me. 75 mil. Uh, 19. Oh, wow. Rich Mitch, man. Maybe your best recommendation, brother. Uh, 1994, this came out. Leathery, spicy. You know what gets me? Is that blend between this uh, almost ivy-like citrusy opening. Like it's very green, ivy. Ivy growing on the side of like a university, right? Mixed with the patchouli from Givenchy Gentleman. Mixed with this unbelievable Russian leather note that just shocked me. It took me a while to figure it out, you know, to, to get a grip on it. Oh, and a Papanax, which is sweet myrrh, and iris, which is posh, and, you know, makes the fragrance feel very three-dimensional. It's just beautiful. And then, finally, we come to the end of an hour and 45-minute video, and we end on a, a expensive, discontinued Tom Ford from 2007 that I think was inspired by stuff like Luciano Pavarotti, Giorgio for Men, um, Givenchy Gentleman and Pierre Cardin's Poor Monsieur. This is Moss Brex. Man, I wish I had a bottle of this stuff. I wish I had a bottle of this stuff. I won't pay a thousand dollars for it, but I wish I had a bottle. It is, oh God. Clary Sage, Tarragon, Rosemary, Beeswax, Spices and Woods with Labdanum, Benzoin, Moss, and Patchouli. And that patchouli mixed with the beeswax gives you flashbacks of the honey-patchouli combination in all of these fragrances we've talked about. But um, especially Pavarotti. There's something about the way the Tarragon and Rosemary blends. Stefan Nilsson created this. I have no clue who that is. But um, Stefan Nilsson created this and doesn't look like he's done much else. Uh, did a fragrance from, from Madonna called Truth or Dare. That was his most famous fragrance, Love Struck by Vera Wang. I have no clue who this person is. But they created this, which is all, this is their masterpiece, I think. Um, you know, I'd love a bottle of this. This is so, so good. And it just goes to show how strong of an offering Tom Ford had when he first came out in 2007. So, that's my uh, fragrance connection video. Also, the unboxing video. I appreciate you watching. Let me know what your favorites are. Uh, I hope you like the series. I'll do more videos like this in the future. Please uh, give the video a thumbs up. As they say, it helps with the YouTube algorithm. It helps get it out to more people who are fragrance lovers because they're out there. There's a lot of people that are... I think, uh, disenfranchised with the modern frag com, if you will. And so, you know, they are, I, I want them to know that a channel like mine exists out there, that it's not just, you know, people sending out rate sheets to brands and lying about what they have to say, that there are people that are really passionate about fragrances. We just, we just have to find each other. Uh, the algorithm has to help. And so that's where liking and subscribing and commenting and all that stuff does help. Uh, it helps the algorithm. So that's why I ask. Uh, if you're into that kind of thing, please, you know, like the video and leave a comment. I love seeing your faces down below. I'll try to respond as, as best as I can. Thanks for watching, everybody. Thanks for the support. Cheers, and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.